Hey, I'm Kyle, and together we're gonna make beautiful websites. Last time on RoboSquid TV, we brainstormed and prototyped a design and finally made a professional mock-up in Photoshop. If you haven't seen that video yet, you should go check it out. And before that, we had our Flexbox tutorial video. But today, we're gonna take our design and translate it into a real functional and responsive website using Flexbox. And we are even going to use the new native CSS variables. But first, after you design your beautiful website, you're going to need a great domain name so you can share that website with the world. Hover.com's intelligent search tool will help you find the perfect domain name with hundreds of extensions to choose from. Thanks to Hover.com for sponsoring this episode and giving you 10% off your first domain name or custom email. Get yours at Hover.com forward slash RoboSquidTV. And with that, let's get started. Let's waste no time and get started and get our code editor open. We will be using Microsoft's Visual Studio code, but whatever code editor you choose is fine. In this tutorial, we're going to be using plain old vanilla HTML and CSS. If you are a more advanced developer, you may use other technologies such as Webpack or you may use SAS. I'm going to use vanilla HTML and CSS so that everyone can follow along, but we'll go over those soon. We need an index.html file and a CSS file. And what I'm doing here is just getting a basic HTML5 template down to get started. This is just the essentials. Since we're dealing with a responsive web design, be sure to include your viewport tag we went over this before, but in short, it keeps your website to scale with different size screens with different resolutions. By the way, we actually built this whole website live right here on YouTube. And if you like, you can also watch the live stream right up here. Now, the way I want to work with our code is just to think of our HTML and CSS as separately as possible. So we're going to focus on the HTML markup first. If we take a look at our mockup, we can think of our design in terms of modules or rows. There's a navigation module, a hero area module, an email form, a features area, a call to action, and a footer. It helps us to think of our websites in these separate pieces to put less load on your mind so that you can focus on one thing at a time or to work with other developers. Now, one thing we're going to use in this tutorial that we haven't talked about before is Emmet. In short, Emmet is a tool that allows us to write something that looks a lot like a CSS selector, but when we press tab, Emmet will expand it into a full HTML structure. We need a nav element, and it will have a class of nav row. So we can use the CSS selector for classes, the period, and then the class name. Then we also need a div element for our hero area, which Emmet assumes we are using by default. So we'll just put the class of hero row. We also need email row, features row, premium row, and a footer with a class of social row. Now when we hit tab, our HTML will be written for us. So this is a really cool way of speeding up things. Whatever code editor that you are using, it's likely that Emmet is supported by default or available as some form of plugin, but I'll have information for you in the description. All right, before we go too far, what we need to think about is what our website will look like on a phone as well as a desktop. If you don't know it, the best practice is to design your website for mobile phones first and then use media queries to adapt the design to a desktop. Since most views today come from mobile phones, it makes more sense to have a mobile first approach to your designs. And generally that means taking areas of content that are too wide and collapsing them. Two quick points. 75% of my audience is on desktop. So for this particular website, desktop first is actually the correct way to approach this. That might not be true for you. Most of your visitors are likely on their phones, so your code should be written for mobile first. You have to know your audience. But point number two, often desktop layouts require more markup than mobile layouts do. So I will always code the desktop first. What we will do is use native CSS variables, and then we can easily switch their values later. If none of that made any sense, stay with me and I will explain. Let's take a look at our navigation area. We have a list of five links, so we'll put an unordered list with five list items. And we'll fill in the list items for our navigation, and we'll worry about the logo image a little later. Now, without even thinking too much about the CSS, we know the list item containing the logo is going to be unique because it sits to the left, where the rest sit to the right. So let's give the list item with the logo an ID of nav logo. And that's it for the navigation. Let's move on to our hero area. Pretty simple. We just have a heading and a paragraph and then two buttons after that. And let's put our buttons inside of a container as well. That will help us in CSS later. And actually, we know that all of our buttons will share some common styles. So let's give all of our buttons a class of button. One more thing we need to do. On desktop, we need to constrain the contents to the center in a column like we did here in the mockup. 
What we are going to do is move the contents inside of a container that we will give a specific width on desktop mode. We'll call it center content. I try to use as few of these CSS helper elements as much as possible, but sometimes it's a little hard to get around it. Next in our email row, everything is pretty similar. We'll add a center content element, and inside we'll have a heading that says sign up for email alerts. And below that, we have an input to enter your email address, which we can add this placeholder attribute to, which puts in a little example of what we want the user to type. And then we'll put another button after that. We'll put both of those inside of a container, just like we did with the buttons in the hero area, and we'll call it email form. We'll treat this like a component in our CSS, which is really cool because then you can reuse this component across your HTML multiple times. All right, now the next module of our page looks the most complicated, but it's actually pretty simple. First things first, in our features row, let's put our center content container. Inside there, we have two rows with the class of featured item row, which contains two columns, which we'll call featured item box. We'll worry about how these appear on the page later, but for now, we know that there are two columns, so we're just making two containers. We'll copy the text from our mockup and move it into our design with the pictures underneath. And that's all the markup for the features row. Cruising right along, we have our premium row, which we have a heading and a button. And for our footer, inside we'll place our center content container and we'll make a list with five items for our five social media links. For now, we'll put some filler text in and we'll place the icons in at the end. And that was all of our HTML. We have a nice skeleton here we can start fleshing out with CSS. And just like with our HTML, we can work one module at a time. The first thing we'll do is add some comments to break up my CSS into sections. There's a million ways to organize and write your CSS. There are also plenty of standardized organization methods. I'll leave some links below. First thing I need to do is set up a simple CSS reset. We have already talked about this before, but basically this area removes some default styles added by your browser that we don't want like the bulletin points and lists. Most importantly, we are changing our box sizing to border box, and we have much more on that in our previous video. Let's skip this variable areas for now, but you'll definitely want to stick around for that. Let's work on our navigation menu. First thing, we'll make sure that our nav row is a flex container and give it a slightly larger font. Now, because I like to work with the modules, as I like to call them, I'll select the unordered list inside of the nav row rather than give it its own class name. So let's make our nav UL a flex container as well. And we'll set the width to 100% and we'll justify our content to space around. Now, because we made this a flex container, the list items will line up horizontally by default. Let's align items to center so that the text vertically centers itself. We'll also give each list item a value of one so that they fill up an equal size with a padding of one EM. Now, how do we deal with the logo being so far to the left while the other items sit towards the right? Well, Flexbox can give us an easy little hack for this. Let's select our container for our logo with the nav logo ID and set the flex value to four, which will make the logo's container four times wider than the other list items. This will give us the look that we're looking for. And we'll also make the text bold. And if you take a look at your page, you have a complete navigation bar. Now for our hero row, for a basic styling, we'll first set the item to, as a flex container and set the direction to column. We'll set our padding and our font size. We'll center our text and we'll assign our background colors and font colors. And we'll align the items to center. We also select the H1 to ensure that our text is capitalized. Okay, let's deal with those buttons in the container. We'll make our button row a flex container and justify our content to space around. This will position the buttons in a row and space them apart, just like in our mockup. We're also going to pull the width in just a little bit to 80% to keep our buttons closer together. Since we want to see what this looks like, let's design our buttons now. For the button class, we're going to give our buttons some padding, and we'll also put in a width to make our buttons uniform. 12 EM works for me in this case. We'll make the font bold and give it a white color. We also want to reset the font size to one REM so it can't inherit a different size and it will stay consistent. If we need a video on the different unit types, leave a comment below. By default, our buttons will be green and we will also ensure that all buttons have capitalized text. While we're here, we might as well create our yellow button as well. We'll create a button pro class and we'll give that to our yellow buttons in our HTML markup and we'll assign our new background color here. All right, now you can take a look at our website and see the hero area. All right, our website is definitely coming together. Let's grind out the rest of the CSS real fast. Onto the email row. 
We'll put in our basic styles, center everything, set our text to white and our background to green. We're also going to use this background image I've already edited and saved. You can achieve this fact with only CSS, but it's extremely hacky and inefficient. I want to add some extra padding to the heading, and we'll set up our email form component. All we're doing here is putting the text input and the button inside of a flex container and making the text input eight times larger. Because the button in this email form is a little different size and shape from the other buttons, I'm just gonna style this one separately using a lot of the same styling. Okay, now here's the hardest part of the whole thing and it's not that bad. We have two rows with two columns on desktop. On mobile, we need to do something to make everything stack vertically, but don't worry. We're going to solve that with the new cool CSS variables, but let's continue on like normal for now. Let's make the features row a flex container and justify our content to the center. Then each of our featured item rows is another flex container, and we'll add that as well. Inside there, each of our columns we named feature item box. It too is a flex container. We want it to behave as a column. They should be equal size, so we'll set their flex to one, and we'll completely center everything and we'll add a small margin. The only other thing we need to do is make sure that our images will scale properly. We'll select the images and set their width to be 80% of the container and set the height to automatically scale accordingly. If you take a look at our page, there is one issue. We want that first featured item row to be reversed. We're going to correct this issue soon, but that's only true on desktop. On mobile, we'll want the text above the image in a row. And when Google comes and reads the source code of our website, it makes more sense to have the items in the same order. The order change we want is visual only. We wouldn't want to hard code this visual change in our code if possible. Since our code is correct for mobile, and we are going to be making a website that is mobile first in the end, I'm going to leave it alone for now, but we'll fix this. Next up is our premium row. And again, we have our basic styles, flex container, direction set to column, some padding, and center everything. We'll set the font color and background color. And just like email row, we have a background image we have pre-made. And we'll add some padding back to the heading. Okay, next we're going to set up the social row, but we're going to add our icons last. Again, we have a flex container centered with two EMs of padding for the social row. We'll grab our unordered list, make it a flex container, make sure the width is set to 100%, and evenly space the items. For the list items themselves, this is what we are going to use to make those round circles that the icons are inside of. We'll make them all dark blue, but you could color each of them separately. Set their border radius to 50% and this makes them into circles. Center the text, add a little padding, and set our font color. Alright guys, that is the majority of our website. Take a deep breath because I know we went through a lot. And if we are going too fast, remember that you can always watch the live stream. What we're going to do next is get into our CSS variables to make our website mobile ready and responsive with media queries. I could probably dedicate a whole mini episode to CSS variables, but let me briefly run through what they are. CSS variables allow us to define one variable and use it in multiple places in our CSS. For instance, if we want the main color of our website to be blue, we could use a variable in place of the color blue, and then in the future, if we want our website to be red, we can simply change the variable. One cool thing about CSS native variables is that they follow cascading rules and can be overwritten in CSS. If we want to have global variables, we should define them at the top of our cascading tree, so that is the pseudo root element. Any variable we want to define starts with two dashes followed by the variable name, and then you define it like a normal CSS rule. Okay, so we defined center width as 80%. Before we use that, let's also prepare our desktop styling. I'm going to create a CSS media query that triggers when the screen has a minimum width of 1600 pixels. So this CSS will only take effect when we are on a desktop sized device. In here, I'm going to define my variables as I want them on desktop. So on desktop, I want our center width value to be 40%. Now where I originally hard coded the width, I can replace it with var and inside parentheses, our variable name. We're just gonna do this to a few of our other values. Featured item, row direction. Featured item row direction is how we are going to handle our featured section for responsiveness. We'll make the direction column by default but set it to row on desktop. And we'll do the same thing for our navigation. 
One more thing we want to look at before we look at our site. We need to reverse the order of the first row of the featured items on desktop mode. So inside of our media query, I'm going to select the featured item row with the pseudo class first child, which will grab the first row in the parent container. In our case, that's the one with beginner's course. And in here, we'll set the flex direction to row reverse. All right, check out our website. We are nearly done. Everything looks like it does in the mock-up for the most part. And best of all, our design is even responsive. The default styling for our design renders this view on phones. And with just a few lines of JavaScript, we could collapse that menu into a drawer. The last thing I want to do is add some icons. To do that, we head over to icomoon.io. In their web app, you can create a new project and select the icons that you will need for your project. What we can even do is upload our logo. I would highly suggest taking one of the other icons and using it as a template to make sure that your logo that you upload is the same size as the other icons. What we can do now is download our project and it will provide us with this symbols definition file. We'll copy and paste that at the bottom of our HTML markup after the footer. They will also give us a little bit of CSS that we need to include in our style sheet. If you click on get code for each icon on ICO Moon, you can get the HTML snippet that you will need to include on the page to display your icon in the form of an SVG element. You can see in the CSS, because this is an SVG, we can manipulate the fill, color, stroke, and a few other things with just CSS. Future food for thought. With the definitions loaded on our page, the elements given to us, we can simply paste the SVG elements where we would like the icons, so we'll take care of those social media icons. The navigation was a little bit trickier, but doable. Sometimes it's hard to align icons with text perfectly, but Flexbox can help us here as well. First of all, we'll place our logo text in the nav logo element inside of a span. Now we can make the nav logo element a flex container, and with the flex direction set to row, since we have two child elements, it'll get them to sit side by side. Now you can adjust the icon size if you want a larger logo, and add some margin. We'll center these two items vertically with align items. And that's it, we did it. Now take a look at your page and test it at different screen sizes. There may be some things that you can change up or tune up. This page could definitely use a few little tweaks here and there, but then this video would go on forever. Add your links, maybe some CSS animations or hover actions, and you have yourself a full mobile first homepage using Flexbox and utilizing CSS variables. When you finish up your website, you'll need a great domain name to share that website with the world. Hover.com's minimalist intelligent search tool will help you find a great domain name for your website. Simply enter a keyword and let Hover.com find the perfect domain name with hundreds of cool extensions available to choose from. And even if you're not building your own website, you can easily connect your domain to tons of services such as Shopify, and in just a few clicks you can get your online business started. You can even connect your new domain name to a custom email address for just $5 a year. If you need any help, call their amazing support team and you'll get connected right to a real human ready to help. Support the show and get 10% off your own custom domain name or email by going to hover.com forward slash RoboSquidTV. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you made it this far, leave a comment down below. If you have any requests or questions, you can leave a comment for that too, of course. And if you need more, be sure to subscribe. Of course, we also have a Facebook, a Twitter, and an Instagram. You can find the source code to this website freely available on our GitHub page. Links in the description. Happy coding, and I will see you next time.